Welcome to Women of the Military podcast, a girl's guide to the military series sponsored by Women Veteran Alliance. Having your finances in order is an important step to starting your military career. A lot of people don't know about finances and a lot of people don't talk about finances. And so it's important to make sure that we dive deep. And as my guest Garrett Sorensen is going to say over and over in the interview, to have a plan, to have goals so that you know where you're going. With the way the retirement has changed to a blended retirement system, it's more important than ever to invest in your TSP to ensure that you get the military to match your contributions and to prepare you for success no matter if you leave the military at four years, 10 years, 20 plus years, whatever it is, having that nest egg that the military will match can really impact and jumpstart your savings for retirement. So let's hear from this week's sponsors, and then we'll dive into this week's episode with Garrett Sorensen from Markham Wealth. Thank you to our title sponsor, Women Veteran Alliance. Women Veteran Alliance is the premier national network focused on directly impacting the quality of life of women veterans. They do this successfully through transforming the way the community networks bring people and programs directly together. Women Veteran Alliance provides weekly webinars, conferences, scholarships for veteran businesses, and more. Check out their membership options and learn how you can be involved in connecting with women veterans by heading over to their website at www.womenveteransalliance.org. But besides connecting women veterans, Women Veteran Alliance does so much more. Every other year in the fall, Women Veteran Alliance hosts their unconference with the goal of bringing women veterans together. I attended in 2021 and I had so much fun connecting with other women veterans and I can't wait until September of 2023 for the next one in Las Vegas. If you would like to learn more about the conference, head down to the show notes for a direct link. You can also find more about the unconference at www.womenveteranalliance.org. Welcome to the show, Garrett. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thanks, Amanda. I'm really happy to be here. So let's start with why did you decide to join the military? Yeah, so that was uh, that was a really long process for me. I didn't join the Army until I was actually 21. And so I left high school. I had a great paying job. I was installing pool tables, of all things, which a lot of people don't think about. But I, I had a great living from that, so much so that I ended up even starting a business right basically out of high school. Uh, everything was going really great, earning a lot of money doing a lot of things, buying stuff, spending all my money, doing all the money mistakes that I'm you know, going to be talking about here now. And 2008 happened. And with 2008, I lost one of my jobs. The business starts going downhill. It starts getting really rough, really rocky to be able to run that business. And I sat there and I was like, what's going on? Like, why... Why did I lose a job? Why, you know, is my business failing now all of a sudden? Everyone's like, oh, the stock market and the economy. I was like, my money's not in the stock market, right? I've got, I've got this business. I don't, I don't have money invested in the stock market. And I started to realize like there's this whole thing that really is controlling us and who we are, the economy and our money and everything like that. And I knew absolutely nothing about it. I finished high school which great. And then it was like, there was nothing, no, no other education from there. It was like, let's just get thrown right into things. And so, you know, I was like, I, I can't have that. I've got to be able to figure some stuff out. So I started being like, I'm going to go to college and try to figure some things out. Well, 2008, they weren't just giving money away for college. And so that prompted me to go in and start talking to some recruiters and started with uh, the Air Force and started, you know, Navy I ended up actually deciding with the army because I told my recruiter I was going to go to, I was going to join for three years, kind of white knuckle my way through it and then get out and go to, go to school. That was my plan. And I was in basic training for the army. I think it was week two and we were running at uh, 445 in the morning, something like that. And I realized how much I absolutely loved the military. It was the best decision I made. It was the first time I had structure. I was earning really, I was earning decent money at the time. I loved it. And so uh, that's what caused me to end up staying in for 10 years. And then even now still serving in the Tennessee National Guard. Well, it's such a cool story. And like, we were talking before, you're like, am I the right guest for this podcast episode? <laughs> yes, yes, you are. Because I love how even from when you joined the military, 
your story has to do with like finances and like the economy. And like I with 2020 happening and like the we hadn't been investing in the stock market and we didn't really know what was going on. And then we were stuck at home, you know, <laughs> watching YouTube videos and we started learning about the economy and finance. And I was like, this whole world exists that I had no idea. And it sounds like you kind of had a similar experience, but it led you to the military, which is really cool. Yeah, it was it was a fun experience. I'm, I always say it was kind of just one of those things I didn't expect to happen and it happened and I'm better for it. I'm really glad it happened that way. Yeah. We're going to take some of your financial wisdom and help shape the future for girls who are considering joining the military. So let's start with their first paycheck. When you're starting the military, what should you do with your first paycheck? Especially like when you're enlisting, you've got your housing paid for and your food pretty much paid for. What do you do with that first paycheck? So I think Starting with the first paycheck, really that what you should be doing should start before you even get that first paycheck. And it's sitting down and creating that budget that is going to determine where your money is going to go. For a lot of people, this might be the first time where you're getting this amount of money consistently for that period of time. For some people, I know when I was in basic training, we had some people and this was a huge pay cut for them, but they just wanted to do it. You know, I, when I, When I was in basic training, we still had at that time, we had a a guy that was in there that was 42 years old. He was literally at the cap of what it was. He lived an entire life. And then we had 17 year olds that were coming right in. Uh, We even had a lot of people from Puerto Rico, and this was their first time in the United States. And so, you know, everyone's got different experiences with the money, but at the same time that they all need to do the same thing, they need to figure out how are we going to be spending this money, allocating those funds before you get that paycheck. So you know that when that money comes in, where you're going to be putting it and then prioritizing really the budget is not the constriction. It's not saying, you know, you can spend money here and you can't spend money here. The budget should be the guiding plan to you accomplishing your goals with that money. And so probably, you know, you're going to have your cell phone bill you need to pay. You might have a car bill you need to pay your insurance and things like that you need to pay. But you need to look at what are my goals for the future? Do I want to buy a house? We need to save for retirement. Do I want to be putting money away into an investment account so I can kind of play around with it because that's something I enjoy? And if those are the things, build out that budget and then from there, prioritize how we're going to pay that. I like to say when you get paid, you should be paying yourself first. That's the most important thing. Take some of that money and and use it for yourself. Put it into a savings account, putting it into an, an investment account, whatever it might be. And then go from there based on that priority of the what's on the budget to kind of dwell out the rest of those funds. The, that way, once you get that first paycheck and really your first paycheck, you're going to get in basic training. So, you know, for me, I didn't even see any of that money until I got to AIT and, you know, it, it had amassed a little bit to that point. And so, you know, I had all this money. I was like, what do I do with it? And you'll see people, I remember the AIT people were buying laptops. They were buying the new boots. They were buying all that stuff. And you could tell they weren't following a plan. Those of us that had a plan on how to spend that money, we were paying our bills. We were doing that. And then on the weekends, when we, if we had a weekend pass, we were lucky enough, we could go out and actually spend money without having to worry about where, you know, when the next payday was, whether it was the first or the 15th. I really like that advice because I think a lot of times you think, oh, I got a paycheck. What do I do with it? And like, that's not the right plan. Like you do have to have a plan, especially if you're in the military, because like maybe you want to go home for Christmas. And so you need to start saving for that flight. You have to start doing that, you know, months in advance instead of like, oh, it's December. I want to pay for the flight and I don't have any money. Like, because especially with the way flights are now, there's a lot of like, costs that you have to think about that take some planning to plan for the future long term or even just like to travel home and see your family. Yeah. And even just emergencies. I used to always joke that the uh, the parking lot for the barracks, it was just a, I mean, it was the closest thing to a, a, a junkyard there because most of the cars weren't even running because a lot of these uh, younger soldiers had their cars parked there. Something would break and it was months before they can get it fixed. And so just even be able to cover for emergencies, this is where having that plan, having that budget is just so important. So true. I love that. So I mentioned in my first question that when you live on base and you have your housing paid for, and you talked about how important it is to have a budget. Do you have any tips when it comes to creating a budget? Because I know there's like the 30, whatever, 20 thing. But when you don't have housing, like how do you figure out what all those percentages are? For me on a, on a budget, the only budget that works 
is the budget that you can stick with. And so I don't like the idea of saying, oh, you have to do this one. If, if you know, the envelope, the old school envelope plan works for you, then use that. I know some people, they still just have a journal like in their handwriting what their budget is. If that works for you, do that. I love Excel. I've got it's a Google sheet that between me and my wife, we can both share, we both look at, we both contribute to what's on the budget. We both contribute to what's going out. And so we can look at it. And the one thing I will say when it comes to creating Creating that budget is consult with the people that that are involved with it. So if you're married, have your spouse be a part of that. That should absolutely be something you're doing. My wife and I try to do it weekly. We're not great at it doing it weekly, but we try to do it weekly. Uh, And if we go a long time without looking at the budget together, she's prompting me. She's saying, Hey, we need to be, we need to be looking at this budget and going over it. Uh, If it's just you, you know, understand if some people don't like the constriction that a budget might bring to them. And so find a way to identify that about yourself and then use a budget that frees you from having the constriction. And so it might be a percentage where you say, whatever I get paid, I'm going to take 15, 20% right off the top. I'm going to put it into the checking account where the de- it's the debit card that I walk around with every single day and I can spend it up until the point where it says declined, right? And then I know that the rest of the money I have there is going towards my bills. For me, I track every penny. I can tell you every penny I've spent since 2017, which seems kind of psychotic, but it's it's what works for me and that's what I like. Really the, the main trick with a budget is try different ones until you find the one that works for you. Once you find the one that works for you, stick with it and, and really just kind of add it into a part of what you're doing for your finances. That's really good advice. And I feel like kind of, I guess I needed to hear that too. Cause I, I have like a budget, but it's very fluid because like things are always changing. And I feel like a budget is really restrictive and it's not very like life happens, like, like the car breaks and then you're like, Oh, my budget is, you know, but like, that's why you have a savings account so that you can pay for it and not, Oh, my budget's ruined. And now I have to cut corners. I think that I've been always like, kind of like trapped in like, when you have a budget, you have to like stick to it and follow it. And that doesn't really work for me and for our family situation because things are always changing and different. I mean, especially when my husband travels, like things I I use meant to track our money and meant is like, you're overspending. And I'm like, yeah, because the military sent my husband on a trip. That's just how it is. And so it's been, it's kind of interesting using that system and trying to work around it. Yeah. I like the idea of, of using the budget should be something that you use to get the freedom. And so it's not, well, this is what oh, I get to spend this. It's I'm using this budget so I can get to a place where I'm more free with my money. And if that means I've got a really good savings account, I've got a you know three to six month emergency fund set aside so that if something does happen, the water heater goes out, the car breaks down, whatever, I don't have to worry about the paycheck taking care of that. I can worry about, I can take that from the savings. And you get to a point where eventually your budget is something that you're just putting the money in, you know, it's going out and you just see it it becomes that thing that's fueling your investments or, or what you're putting towards your goals. Once you hit that point, it's liberating and it's exciting to do the budget because you're like, wow, look how much money we get to save this month because we've done the right things because we've been following the budget. Yeah, that's a great definition. So my next question is, what are the most common things that you've seen that get people in financial trouble, especially when joining the military? Ooh, that is a good question. So I will say it's the one that it's the one that I had. Honestly, it was I had no education on a lot of the things uh, related to finances. And so when we went to AIT, I still remember there was a class. I don't know if they do this anymore or not, but we had a class where these two people came in and it was an entire day of just learning about the TSP. And right then and there, old school, I say old school, it was so long ago, but it does seem so crazy that we had a paper application that we used where we put how much of our paycheck we wanted to contribute to it. And they were kind of going over how the TSP works and stuff like that. I remember sitting there and there were some people that were just, they didn't even have their pamphlet open. They weren't looking at it. They weren't paying attention at all. It was like they care, they could care less about what these guys are talking about. Like, this is your main investment account. Another one, you know, being in the military, the one thing that we kind of fall into is within our units, within, you know, our battalion or whatever it might be, we tend to have a, a bit of group think. And there's always that one, that one quote unquote financial professional that is going to tell you because they bought into Dogecoin when it was less than a penny and it's 30 cents now. So you got to get in before it hits a dollar because, you know, or they bought into AMC when it was super low and it's taken off or they bought Tesla when it was a hundred dollars and it's almost a thousand dollars now. And you hear 
hear that stuff and with no other real outside voice to come in and say, is this a good idea? Is this a bad idea for you as an individual? It becomes very attractive to go and start using, utilizing those things. Another one that that I always think about, especially when you look at young people, you know, I say, quote unquote, young is like in the military, like, you know, early um, privates and things like that. When you go and look at the finance options outside of most bases, they are terrible, terrible options for these people. Uh, and we're not even just talking about cars where the, the finance here, because you've got bad credit or anything like that. Uh, I fell victim to it as well, where I could go. And they used to have those payday loan places for the military where you would just set up the allotment through my pay. You get a thousand, you know, $2,000, whatever they approved you for, and you're giving them $200 a month by an allotment for the rest of your contract. Those things are terrible. But even people that you, where you can get financial advice, when you go outside the base, there's places that claim to be military experts when it comes to the, uh, the finances and stuff like that. And in reality, they're just trying to sell you life insurance, or they're trying to sell you some mutual fund or, you know, they're where they're going to be making a lot of money off of it and stuff like that. And so I always say it's really what puts people in financial trouble is just not having the education on these finances and then not having somebody that they can go and talk to, to get a professional expert opinion on. And I mean, you think about your listeners to this podcast, the reason people are listening to this podcast is because they're trying to get educated as a woman who wants to join the military. What are the things that they need to know? How can they become better prepared? And it's great that they're doing that. I wish more people did that for things um, when it came to their finances. So getting that education, reaching out, finding the professionals that aren't trying to you know, sell them something or, or make money where they can get really objective advice, I think is, is going to be really huge when it comes to uh, avoiding getting into financial trouble. More often than not, when they get into financial trouble, it's because they did. They put their money into Dogecoin when it was at 60 cents and now it's five cents or something like that. They bought this policy that they can hardly afford or a car that they can hardly afford because you know so-and-so said that it was going to be a good idea for them. And, and now they're living outside of their means. They're not following that budget and it's putting a strain on them. And, and it's really, really difficult once you get in that situation to kind of pull yourself out. That's so true. Yeah. I love the analogy of like how people are listening to this series to learn about joining the military and how important it is to learn about finances and to get all the information that you need when you're joining about finances, especially the way that the military retirement has changed, because a lot of people today still think that it's serve 20 years and get out. And it's changed dramatically with the blended retirement system where you like they match your TSP. So like that makes your TSP even more desirable to use. And you don't walk away from the military with nothing. Now you have that match money that can help you. And there's so much advice and information. And a lot of people don't know about finances because it's taboo and nobody talks about it. And it's really important to do your research. Well, and, it, and it's difficult too. It's something that, I mean, it takes years for you to really become, even for me to become quote unquote, an expert on these things. You look at, I work here uh, with a bunch of CPAs in our office. I mean, these people went to school for years to be able to understand how to file taxes. And yet you're going to have, you're going to have somebody in your unit that's going to tell you, oh, you don't need to worry about that. You just deduct all this and you you got your house, just start a business and put a tiny desk up there and then write off your whole home. And then, you know, that's what's going to get you audited by the IRS. And so there's a lot of really bad advice out there, unfortunately, especially for the military. Anecdotally, I'm in a group for uh, it's their veterans and it's like a personal finance group on Facebook. And there's an argument going on there right now about whether or not a house is considered an asset or a liability. And you start to realize there's there's a lot of people out there that have absolutely no idea what they're talking about when it comes to when it comes to their finances and and the things that they own and and the difference between income and appreciation and and what's liability and what's risk and why are those things different and so a little bit self-serving in here but even where you get the advice making sure that the advice you're getting is objective people come to this podcast because they know they're going to be getting objective advice when i started my podcast operation veteran finance the first thing I did was I went and looked out and I said, who else is having this conversation for veterans? And the only thing I found was one where they were pushing everyone to go to real estate. There's nothing wrong with real estate uh, as a part of your investment portfolio. But when that's the only thing that they're talking about, or, you know, it's, hey, don't, don't save anywhere else. The only thing you need to do is buy real estate. That gets me a little bit worried because that might not be right for everybody. You might not have the risk tolerance or you might not have 
just the ability to cash flow. And if you listen to this really subjective advice on what you should be doing with your money, it can put you in a bad situation because you don't know any better. Another one that I see too, a lot on TikTok now, I, I get in a lot of uh, you know comment wars on TikTok uh, where these people are like, oh, I can, you know, I've made a million dollars off these investments. All you have to do to do what I do is buy my program or, you know, buy my, and I'm just, if you're making all this money from this, why do you, why do you need to sell these courses or why do I need to pay money to be a part of your alpha group? It's things like that, where I say, you know, really people need to be a little bit more judicial on, on their decision-making process to look at that and say, is this the right thing for me? Is there a place where I can get better objective advice? And is it free? We, the reason I started this podcast is because it's from, you know, my podcast operation, better finance is because I want to just put the information out for free. And it's the same information that, uh, we teach what well, we used to teach at the uh, Pentagon and the white house for the transitioning flag officers. These are generals that are retiring from the military. We used to teach that course uh, for the investing and financial planning. And that's great for them, but for a lot of them, they've, they're going to write their own check when they get out. But you know, me as a staff sergeant, I didn't get that. When I transitioned from active duty, I didn't get that. I got some lady coming in and saying like, odds are you're not going to make a whole lot of money. So here's, here's a budget, fill it out and have a nice day. So it, it's different. And so we want to make sure that we are giving the best information out there, that we're doing it for free. There's no paywall that they have to, that we're going to try to hide behind or anything like that. Because at the end of the day, the rising tide raises all boats in this situation. If we can make the military smarter about their finances, put them in a better situation, it's going to improve the overall stance of, of the military completely. I think, you know, just from finances, people getting a lot of that stuff correctly, we'll see less homeless veterans out on the street. We can start seeing that 22 a day number start really coming down because people aren't worried about one of the most stressful things in their life. I mean, there's there's so much of a benefit just to getting the education from this financial thing that that we really don't know a whole lot about that it, it really benefits us. I get passionate about it if you can't tell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you remind me of like when I'm talking about women in the military, you're like so yeah. passionate. But I love it because it's so true. I got the same advice. Like if they're charging you money and they made millions of dollars on these investments, like that doesn't quite add up because they shouldn't need you know, like I need you to pay for this course because I'm going to help you. It's like, uh, I feel like I'm helping you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And there's, there's enough free resources out there, especially from the military. We're just, you do have to look for them. Yeah. We talked about like the most common ways that people can find themselves in financial trouble. What if you're already in financial trouble and you have debt? Like, how do you get out of debt? What's the best advice that you have for people who are in that situation? So when we typically see people that, especially with debt, if they're at a place where they're starting to become worried about debt and it's really become a stressor for them, what we have to fix first and foremost is just the psychological aspect of what put us into debt right? This idea that we can spend and spend and spend, there's going to be more money in the future. And so it's okay for me to go and swipe this credit card or buy this car that might take me right up to the limit of what I can afford. And now I you know, can't afford all these other things that I didn't consider. We have to understand why did we get into this situation? For a lot of people, they might be in debt just because there was something that bad, something bad happened, right? Something broke down and they had to go into debt in order to you know, fix the car, whatever it might be. And then there's a lot of debt. I don't want to discount like medical debt and things like that, that might not be covered, or they might be joining the military beforehand that is, you know, burning burdensome to them. And so it's really understand, is this something that we put ourselves into because we weren't paying attention to our finances, we weren't doing the right thing? Or is this something that was a little bit more circumstantial and now we just have to kind of put a focus on being able to come out of it? Either way, really what we need to end up getting to a point to is that this is something that it's not going to fix itself. So, you know, just like in the military, if you have some type of mission, you have to create a plan and you have to follow that plan in order to accomplish the mission. And so putting together a concrete, strict plan that you can follow that allows you to slowly, but you, you know, surely kind of pay off that debt and get to a place where you're going to be more financially fit. That's really all it takes. Building out that budget, saying, you know, if, if you were like me when I was young and, and, you know, I got, I joined the military and I got that credit card that had a $1,500 limit thing was maxed out six weeks later. I had to sit down and say, I, I did this to myself and now I need to go through and, and I don't get to go out for the next couple of weeks. I don't get to go to Carolina beach or Myrtle beach with my friends because I've got to pay off this credit card. 
if there's other things like this was a maintenance emergency or some type of emergency that popped up and I didn't have the funds available, I need to pay this off, but I have to recognize that this is something that might happen again. And so I need to make sure that I have an emergency fund or I've got savings, some type of savings so that in the future, I'm not having to go into debt to take care of this. And then just follow the plan, set up that plan, identify the psychology behind why we got into the situation, focus on that, and then follow the plan. The benefit that we have with the military is there's a lot of resources out there available to them if you are in a situation where you're worried about your finances. Uh, I know personally for me, and I, I wish I could remember the name of the office there on Fort Bragg where I did it, but I had a, an emergency with my car. I think I had to get new tires or something like that on my car. I couldn't even drive it. And I had to, I had to get it registered again. And I had to go in there and say, I need help with this. And I had money that same day in my account. I got to sit down with this professional and, and be like, here's my bills. This is why I can't afford it. And she was like, yeah, you need help with this. And so they gave me that money. And I think I had to pay it back interest-free maybe, uh, but there's programs like that here in the Tennessee National Guard. We have programs where if a soldier needs money, we've got ways to get the money almost immediately. I think almost up to a thousand dollars. And then there's you know resources to pay your taxes, things like that. There's a lot of resources available to military members through military one source or whatever it might be that it's going to help them fix that immediate situation and then get on the right path in order to be able to cover and pay and, and get out of debt. Yeah, the programs through finance don't charge you interest and you pay it back. And unlike the payday loans where they charge you an insane interest rate and get you can get you in all kinds of trouble, like, yeah, you have the money, but then now you have this debt and it's at such a high interest rate, you can't even afford the monthly payment. So yeah, the finance office is such a great resource in helping people. I have heard about that. And uh, when I was in the Air Force, it was well known, at least to my unit of how you could go to finance and get a debt free loan and, and how that can help you. Yeah, I think I made every single mistake that you can think of when it comes to your finances, and so, and that, I think I always joke that's why that's why I got to where I'm at right now. I didn't ever think I was going to be working in finance, and then I just happened to make every mistake, and I learned from it the hard way. And now we try to help people learn from my mistakes without having to go through them. So, and it shows that you can recover from making mistakes. It's not the end. You you just have to have a plan. I love how you just keep saying like, your budget is a plan. Getting out of debt, you have to play, have a plan. It's not just like, oh, I'll just pay it off. Like you have to have a plan so that you can get to where you want to go. Yeah, absolutely. Your financial plan, basically you can't do anything unless it's written down and you know where you're going to be going with it. That is just key to, to finances. So I want to shift a little bit and move more into like stereotypes. And are there specific situations that you've seen with how military women directly are affected by finances? Yeah. You know, stereotypically, when we look at, especially for women in the military, is there's this, this strange sense of, of what kind of comes about for how they earn their money. And, and when you look at the pay gap that we see in uh, in the civilian sector and things like that, we that becomes a little bit less when we're actually looking at earnings in the military. Now, there is still a discrepancy in the way of military ranks between women and, and, and how they, you know, but the pay is the same at the end of the day. And so now it's just more so about women going up into the ranks, having a higher level of earnings and things like that. So when we kind of remove that pay gap aspect uh, uh, aspect of it, we see what are some of the stereotypes that women are falling into, especially when it comes to money in the military. One thing that I saw, and this was on LinkedIn, I think, is that women are less likely to sign up for the TSP than their male counterparts, which is interesting to me. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't know why that was. Another one was women that are retiring from the military are also less likely to sign for the survivor benefit pension program, SBP. And so it's strange that these things are taking place. And I don't think it's inherent in any aspect of like, uh, you know, women aren't receiving the education or they're not earning or they're not getting to the ranks or anything like that. But there, there are still these aspects of where women aren't taking advantage of some of the particulars that are available to them being a veteran, being a member of the military. And so focusing on the education to be able to, for them to take advantage of that, I think is really big. But stereotypically, when you have uh, dual military, for instance, is one thing I think about. Dual military, and a lot of my clients I've talked to, a lot of people I've talked to that were dual military, I think people think that, well, the man's going to handle the finances, right? They're going to take care of the paycheck. They're going to pay the bills, whatever. And the woman's going to 
I don't know, do something else, whatever it might be. But it's it, that's no longer the case. And Amanda, you and I were talking about this just before we came on here. It's almost always where even whether it's dual military or not, that the woman is the one that's handling the the bills. They're the ones that know the majority of the money. It's the it's the spouse, the wife in that situation that's being able to really take care of and talk to these things. And so uh, even in single service member families where the male is retiring uh, and we're going through a financial plan about about what's going to be taking place. I'm really talking to the wife about the money. I'm talking to her about the investments. I'm talking to her about what bills are being paid. And so, you know, that's one of those big stereotypes where I think people have come in and been like, oh, you know, the men handles all the money, everything like that. But in reality, it's it's women are taking care of the finances that are coming into this. And so for uh, single women that are in the military, you're going to have to be taking your finances. Unfortunately, when you get married, you're probably going to have to take care of your husband's as well, or your wife's as well, right? <laughs> That's just something that you're going to have to start looking into. And it does become a burden, especially for dual military when they're looking at, they still have their job. You know, where I was at, uh, with Fort Bragg, our unit was actually the first unit where we had um, the female lieutenants coming into the field artillery. It was a field artillery unit there. We had the first two that came in and it was really incredible uh, to see them come in. And it changed the dynamics of military families. When you look at the fact that these women were going to get married, potentially have kids, have families, and now they're in a combat arms, which has a really high op tempo before it was, oh, you know, my husband might be infantry or whatever they might be combat arms. And so they're the ones that are deploying a lot. They're the ones that are going to be gone. These women were in the same boat that we were in, where they were going to experience a lot of the same situations. And that's the same case with military police, where they have that high op tempo. It's it's no longer where they're going to be fuelers or, or you know something that's coming into this world where uh, not that they don't have that high op tempo, but it might not be the same as, as particular uh, for combat arms. And so just recognizing that there are family roles are going to start to come into play within the dynamics of the finances that might end up still falling on the spouse uh, just because really they might be the best equipped to handle that situation. The husband may not be involved in the finances as much as, as they would like to be. You know, breaking that stereotype of, oh, this is something that men handle. It's really not. It is it is women that are handling that. And so making sure that you coming to this are, are taken care of and prepared financially. One thought that just came to my head, and we didn't talk about this before, but I think the one thing I would say is that when it comes to finances that women should be focusing on specifically is one of the biggest indicators of wealth in the future for a couple is who you marry. And that seems very strange, but just being married, you you have a higher chance of, uh, or you have a, a better chance of being a higher earner later in life. You have a better chance of saving later in life. You have a better chance of, uh, of home ownership. There's a lot of things that kind of play into that idea. And so when you look at the aspect of wealth within couples, one of the biggest drivers to that is the that family dynamic of, of who you marry. And so, you know, I would always say that when we look at how we make these decisions, just like we would say, if we're going to buy a house, if we're going to buy a good car, right? Who we marry should be a really important part of what we look at. And it's almost one of those family dynamics that not a lot of people think about because uh, they're like, oh, I'm going to get married for love. Well, that's fine. But, you know, ask your husband or, you know, ask your wife, how do you spend money? <laughs> you know, Are you in a lot of debt? When you get your paycheck, do you like to follow a budget? Do you not like to follow a budget? And so I think, you know, and having that question, especially because as uh, women coming into this relationship, it might come down to them to be taking care of that. Understanding how their husband or wife is taking care of or, or currently working on those aspects, I think is going to be a really important part of it. That's a really good point because my husband and I were both we both graduated debt free from college and that like changed a lot of our lieutenant friends had a lot of debt from college and like they couldn't do things financially that we could because we didn't have that debt that they were paying off after school and so like knowing those things, how much debt do you have from college or from whatever and how that affects you? Because that really does change like the whole dynamics. You could go from no debt to like a hundred thousand dollars of debt when you get married. If, especially if you don't talk about it, it could be a huge wake up call for what's going on in your life. Yeah. I think just having that conversation is big, especially when we look at the fact that odds are you as, as the, the wife in the relationship, you might end up being the one most likely taking care of the finances. If you want to know, 
You know, you want to know how that other person in that relationship, how they view money, how they view investing. Um, and then really just talking about it doesn't have to be like, you know, I'm not saying, oh, my husband or wife's bad with money, so we shouldn't get married. But really just having the conversation and trying to identify those pitfalls is going to be, uh, that's going to be a big part for, for women, especially in the military. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So like, I can't marry you. You have debt. <laughs> it's all over. <laughs> And so I feel like we kind of debunked some of the stereotypes around finances, but was there anything else that you missed that you wanted to dive a little bit deeper into? Yeah. You know, I think, I think one stereotype you might see is that women aren't as involved with investing or saving. Um, when it comes to spending, you know, I I've always seen that women are typically the spenders in the relationship. Like they are always going shopping and stuff like that. And a lot of those stereotypes just are not true. You know, even in the military, I know that like, you know, a lot, I see my friends and they're out buying the new boots and they've got the big trucks and while their wife's driving the van or the SUV or whatever, and they're, you know, they've got the brand new Raptor or whatever. And I'm just like, you're clearly the person, the husband's clearly the person spending the money here. And the wife's the one just trying to manage that. And so these, these stereotypes that oh, women don't handle the investments that might be true from the standpoints of where we saw our family, right? Uh, I know that in my household, I was really fortunate that I grew up with my mom and three sisters and, you know, four very powerful women that managed a lot of the aspects in their life. And it was, it was very eye opening to me. And so I didn't, I didn't come into this world where I saw like, oh, you know, I'm, I've got to be the breadwinner and all this stuff. But for a lot of people that might've been the case, especially for a lot of the men in the military, they may look at this and say, you know, my dad paid all the bills. My dad earned the living and stuff like that. And so that's my job as well. And it's just, it's a stereotype that needs to be broken. If that's something that when you're, when you're looking at who you're looking to marry, if that's something they believe, then, then you really need to make sure you have that conversation about that. Yeah. My husband is definitely the spender in our relationship. Yeah, we have a lot of Legos. I can prove it. <laughs> <laughs> We've kind of like role reversal flip because like I am a saver and he's a spender. And like, we found a dynamic that works for both of us, but it requires a lot of communication between both him and I on like what we want having goals for the future, figuring out like what investments to do. And it is, it's something that you need to be talking about before you're married, when you're married and continually be a conversation that happens because it is so important that we talk about money and we don't get afraid of it. And I think that's why I wanted to include this topic for the series, because it's so important that we talk about finances and that we don't just assume like, someone else will take care of it. Like, especially if you're a single female joining the military, you're the one who's right. got your paycheck. You need to decide what you're going to do and you need to make the best decisions for yourself. Yeah. For, I mean, for single women in the military have the goal. If you want to buy a house, you don't have to wait until you're married to buy a house, right? Like you can save and do those things. You don't have to wait. You should start saving. You should start investing. You should start doing all those things right now because what you focus on when you're single in that scenario, I mean, you're just, you're, it's the law of attraction. You're going to be putting out something better out there for you. And, and even still, I mean, if you don't want to get married, maybe you don't want to have kids, whatever it might be, you're building towards your future at that point in time. And regardless of what the stereotypes are, you need to go out and you need to focus on getting the education so that you can better yourself and not be a statistic, not be something where they're like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't understand investing and I'm just going to let my husband or partner take care of that. Make sure that you're getting that education and take care of yourself because that's, that's really important. And I like what you said about like planning to buy a house. Sometimes I think we focus on like saving for retirement and we forget like we're living our life right now. And so maybe don't invest 15% of your paycheck into your TSP. Take some of that extra money and like start putting in a savings account so that you can buy a house and the VA benefits that you can get a house without having to put 20% down is another great thing that can really open up the door for your future. It's a, one of the great things about the military is the financial benefits that you get through your service so that you can become a homeowner. So you can match your retirement, all the different things that you can get from the military. Yeah, absolutely. So my last question kind of ties into we talked about real estate and like saving for buying a house. So what other investments are there that people should consider besides their TSP account? Like the TSP is great. The fact the military matches it is really great. So that 5% is really a worthwhile, in my opinion, investment. But what other things? I don't think you should put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And so, you know, I, I always look at kind of that order of operations of how you want to be saving and investing. And so for 
women that are joining the military, the one thing you want to definitely look at, especially if you're joining now, you're on that new blended retirement system. So you're going to have that 1%. You're going to have the match. You definitely need to be putting in to the TSP to get the full benefit of that match. That should be first and foremost where you're saving is put in up to the point where you get 100% of the match and then not a percent more. I stop right there in the beginning because then what I want to focus on from there is how am I protecting what I have now, right? Do I have an emergency fund? If you need an emergency fund, you know, three to six months, depending if you're single or married, if your spouse is working or not, is how you should really be looking at that. That emergency fund needs to be three to six months of your expenses. So you look at your budget and you say, this is what I need in order just to survive, right? I got my cell phone bill, my car bill, whatever, all this, I'm going to write that down. I'm going to multiply it by three or by six for the month. And I say, that's going to be what I need to have just available to me something goes wrong. Uh, For my wife and I, it's about $25,000 that we have set aside just to make sure that if something breaks, you know, we bought a house last year. If, uh, if our water heater goes out, that's on us. Now we bought our house. We moved in five days later, the garage door was broken. You have to have a garage door that works. And it was $500. And, you know, if we had bought a house and put all of our money that we had available and savings, whatever into that house, and then the garage door breaks, we would have been going and using the credit card. But, you know, luckily we had the money available to us. So making sure that you have that that savings, that nest egg available to you, that cushion that's going to protect you if something goes wrong, that's really important. And honestly, I say after you've done the TSP, make sure you have that savings account. Once you have that, that's when you start looking at other investment options available to you. One that I like, it's uh, just an IRA, just a Roth IRA. You can put up to $6,000, depending on you know when you're listening to this, of course, it changes every year, but uh, you can put you know a certain amount of money in there based on your earnings and things like that uh, for you and your spouse at that that point in time. So that's a really good, great place to start. And then what are your goals that you have? I know a lot of people, they say, well, I want to buy a house and the VA, yes, the VA loan, but if I put X amount down, then it's going to you know, fix my interest rate, or I don't have to have that insurance, or I don't have to have whatever it might be. Find out what those goals are. You know, If it's buying a house, do you want to put money down or do you want to just use the, you know, the uh, 0% down. Even when my wife and I closed, we still had to pay titling because the real estate market here in Nashville is insane. And we were just, I think we were lucky. So yeah, we were happy to pay titling and things like that. But that might be something that you're looking at when it comes to making that decision. Are you trying to plan a trip to go overseas? You know, my wife and I have a trip here in a couple of weeks where we're going to Brazil and it's for a wedding. We knew about the wedding a few months in advance. And instead of being like, we said right then and there, we said, what is this going to cost us for this wedding? It's over overseas in Brazil, we started saving right away to make sure that we could budget that into what we were doing. That's something that I think it's, that's, that's more beneficial to us. The fact that we can pay for that trip outright than us putting extra money into a retirement account. We want to still make sure that we're saving for retirement. We all want to retire one day, but I tell people, if you're in the military and when you are looking to retire, when you look to ETS, you might want to start a business. Your money's better off sitting in some safe haven where you're where you're piling cash so that when you leave the military, you can go and start that business. And so now, you know, anybody that's trying to sell you some whole life policy because it's, you know, great savings or you should be buying Tesla or just buy the S&P 500, whatever it is, right? That's not the right advice for you because your goal is actually to start a business and you need capital to start a business. And you being able to fund that capital yourself is going to be important. You being able to buy a house might be more important than you saving here in the short term. You still need to do both in the long run. Even when you start a business, eventually you need to start saving for retirement or whatever it might be. Uh, But understanding what your goals are, prioritizing that according to your financial plan, and then saving by the best vehicle available to you to help you accomplish that goal is going to be key. I think, you know, when you get to a point where you're earning more money and you're like, geez, I'm, you know, I bought a house, I'm saving for a second house. And we, you know, we've got a nest egg and we're, we've got money in our vacation fund and I might want to start a business for building towards that. That's when then I'd go back and say, okay, maybe I could put some more in the TSP. And even then it's, you know, maybe who knows, maybe you're going to mess, you know, go in and buy some, uh, some Dogecoin at that point and listen to that guy in your unit finally. And I actually buy some Dogecoin if you want to, but that's, you got to be far, far uh, ahead in that situation. <laughs>
Yeah, those are such great advice and things that like I'm invest in my Roth and I started investing in a Roth when I first joined the military and buying a house and all the different things. Those are, you can't just save for retirement. You have to like live your life. And it goes back to your, the very first answer to the question. Like you have to have a plan. You have to have goals. You have to know where you're going. If you're just driving and you don't know where you're going, you're not going to end up where you want to be. So I think this ties it all together really well. Yeah. I, you know, the one thing I always joke about is like our phones. I talk to people all the time and I'll ask them, I say, do you own your phone outright? And, you know, more often than not, people are like, oh, you know, I'm making that monthly payment. I get to upgrade every year or whatever. And I'm just, you know, it's one of those things where you might, you might be better off saving that $25, $30 a month so that you can buy the new phone every, you know, year. It might be more than that, that you'd have to save to buy a new phone, but that might be a better return on investment for you just because it frees up more cash flow throughout the month. So you can't just rigidly say, this is the best thing to do for the savings and stuff like that. It really is going to be individual. And the best way to focus on that is by having that financial plan. That financial plan needs to be something written, something that you can look at. And it should be that guiding principle. Just like you said, you don't just get in your car and start driving. We've all got GPS. I've lived in Nashville for over a year or over 10 years now, and I still use GPS to get everywhere. I know how to get there, but it's just like, I still, because it is it is the guiding principle that's going to get me to where I need to be. Same thing with your financial plan. It needs to be the guiding principle that tells you how you should be saving, how you can invest, You know, look at what are your potential for earnings? What are your potentials for savings? And, and use that as, as that vehicle to accumulate wealth. Yeah, this has been such a great conversation and I'm really glad that we got to do this interview. And I want to wrap it up with the advice question that I ask all my guests, which is what advice would you give to someone who's considering joining the military? And it can be financial or it can be just general. It's up to you. What advice to someone joining the military? Gosh, that's hard. I, you know, I would say again, I mean, it goes back, I guess I sound like a broken record, have a plan, have a really good plan. I look at investing. So when, when somebody asks me about investing, they might say, Hey, Garrett, like I want to, I want to, I'm thinking about buying this investment. Crypto was a big one. They were like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about buying crypto and something like that. And I always ask them the same thing. I say, what is your exit strategy? When do you get out? When somebody comes to me and they say, I'm thinking about starting a business. I always say, what is the plan at the end? Right? Where, where do you see yourself at the end? And we often don't know that. And so I, like I told you, I, when I joined, I told my recruiter, I was going to white knuckle my way through three years and then get out. I did 10 years active duty and I've been in the national guard for almost three years now. Uh, I mean, it's, we have no idea how it's actually going to come about, but probably like, I don't know, I I can't speak for you, Amanda, but I know for me, I just kind of woke up and I was like, maybe I should join the military one day. And I walked into a bunch of recruiters offices and listened to what they said. And then a couple of weeks later, I was in basic training. That seems crazy to me now, you know, because if I was going to join the military today, if I was going to start over again today, I would sit down and say, okay, what specifically do I need to know? Am I going to do a three-year contract? Am I going to do a five-year contract? At the end of that contract, am I going to stay? I had no idea that I was only going to do 10 years active duty in the military. At one point in time, I was only going to do three. And then the next I was going to do 20. The reason that I only did 10 was because I accomplished so many of my goals. Once I actually started setting goals, I accomplished so many of them that I realized the military had really served a purpose for me. And it was time for me to to move on and start accomplishing goals as a civilian, which were my next really big goals, Uh, finishing my MBA full time, being able to actually walk uh, for a graduation because I never got to do that. When I, I I finished my I finished my undergrad when I was in the military, I didn't get to go and have a graduation. My graduation was getting my diploma from the postman. Um, and so, you know, I started looking at building a business, being able to serve clients. These are things that I couldn't do in the military. And so once I started setting those goals, I realized, and my plans changed, but you can sit down before you join the military and say, if I join if I only do three years, what does that look like? Right. If I do five years, what does that look like? If I do 20 years, if I, if I do 33 years, what does that look like? Think about that again, write that down, have the goals for everything. And then from there, start the conversation with the recruiter and people that you know, and trust listening to this podcast, getting really good education about it, and then make the decision from there. That's really great advice. Thank you again. I really appreciated hearing all your expertise and guidance and it's exactly what I wanted for this episode. So thank you. Thank you, Amanda. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I really want to thank Garrett for providing his expertise in finances and showing that you can learn from making mistakes and hopefully the information that he gave you will help you in your journey. And I also wanted to mention that he offers 
free financial planning through his company. So if you would like to learn more, please head to the show notes to get connected with him or you can also email him at garrett.sorensen at markhamwealth.com. And I'll put that in the show notes so that it's easy to find. But I just wanted to make sure you knew that was available. Thanks so much for listening to this week's episode. I really hope that it helped you in your journey to the military. And if you want to learn more about joining the military, please check out my new book, A Girl's Guide to Military Service. And I'll have a link so you can pre-order in the show notes. And I also want to give another shout out to our sponsors for the series, Women Veteran Alliance. Jay Volbrecht Consulting, Garrett Sorensen with Markham Wealth, Photography by Trish Algrea-Smith, Serve Like Her, and Nomadies Collections. You can learn more about our sponsors at the Girl's Guide to the Military landing page, which I have linked to in the show notes where you can also find every episode from the series. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you'll come back next week. Markham Wealth LLC is a SEC registered investment advisory firm with its principal place of business in Ohio. Registration is not an endorsement of the firm or its representatives by securities regulators, nor is it an indication that the advisor has a particular level of skill or ability. This discussion is intended to be general and educational in nature and is not tailored to any listener's individual circumstances or financial situation. You should not assume that any discussion or information contained herein serves as the receipt of or as a substitute for personalized investment advice. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. This communication should not be construed as a recommendation or solicitation to take or refrain from taking any particular course of action. Due to various factors, including changing regulations and market conditions, the information discussed may no longer be reflective of current positions or recommendations. While information presented is believed to be factual and up-to-date as the date of publication, Markham Wealth does not guarantee its accuracy, and it should not be regarded as a complete analysis of the subjects discussed. The subjects discussed herein are general in nature, provided for informational purposes only, and should not be construed as legal, tax, or investment advice. Listeners should consult with professionals slash professionals of his or her choosing regarding their specific legal, tax, or financial situation.